1990s. He was the first American since Judge Robert Jackson in Nuremberg to be the chief prosecutor of such a court. Out of all those things, though, perhaps he's most proud of the group he founded called Impunity Watch at Syracuse University, which is a group of law students who abuses in real time around the world. And my hunch is why perhaps he agreed to speak to us today, and perhaps there's several reasons, is that when he looks at their faces, he also sees yours. Professor Crane and his wife live in the Washington, D.C. area. They have two children, Catherine and David, who live and work in North Carolina. And as he stands here beside us today, who are we to enjoy the company of someone who's literally changed the world? David, on behalf of our students, our staff, and sponsors of the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies, we're so proud and happy to have you here today. And we look forward to hearing more about your work, which is so important to us all. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I'm a mover. So, I, and so I'm always uh, walking around in my law classes or when I was uh, uh, trying to prove cases against bad uh, individuals, I was moving around the courtroom and the cameras are following me and driving them crazy. So I see my wonderful friend, Greg Peterson, who's got his uh, camera all set up and it was focused on one place, but he's going to have to follow me around. Congratulations to all of you, because the most, the biggest challenge the biggest challenge in this business of facing down what I call the beast of impunity is indifference. That was my biggest challenge in West Africa. I mean, prosecuting those who bore the greatest responsibility for the murder, rape, maiming, and mutilation of 1.2 million human beings. Well, that was my job. And I had a wonderful team to do this, and so that wasn't the challenge. You know what the challenge was? challenge was getting the rest of the world to give a damn. I traveled the world talking to politicians, diplomats, heads of state, talking to them about what we were doing in West Africa and trying to get some type of political buildup to support the court in our work, to include handing over President Charles Taylor of Liberia for a fair trial. The issue was Ten years, a horror story that took place in West Africa and most of the world didn't understand what that was. So this type of program, you wonderful ladies and gentlemen, are the core by which we can continue to advance into the 21st century, because you're the future, that we can face down the beast of impunity. And so that's why I came. Hamburg, New York. You know, I saw Niagara Falls for the first time in my life yesterday. I've traveled the world, seen all sorts of wonderful and terrible things. I've never seen Horseshoe Falls until yesterday afternoon. And Made of the Mist. It's great. Boy, did I get wet. And I could not believe it. What an exhilarating experience. Anybody been here to Niagara Falls? Good. I hope so. Because, you know, it's funny. You live regionally. Like, I live in Washington, D.C., and I drive by the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, you know, it's, you know, okay. So I can understand if you've never been to Niagara Falls, because I've never been to the top of the Washington Monument. Probably because I'm a little bit afraid of heights, but uh, I'm just too busy to do it. So uh, boy, what a wonderful treasure. Another treasure, I think in my mind, in my perspective, that's even more important, the treasure that you have is actually just south of here, in Jamestown and Chautauqua. Because every year what I do, you saw the picture of Luis Marino Campo, my good friend, I bring all of the world's former and current chief prosecutors from Yugoslavia, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, uh, Nuremberg. I have the last three living Nuremberg prosecutors coming, uh, along with uh, great support from uh, the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. That is a national treasure, and it's just south of here. Uh, so I encourage, I understand that you're all going to come and visit us uh, at the end of the month, right? That's awesome. Well, you're going to see of the 12 living, current, and former chief prosecutors in history, nine of them will be there uh, in, at the end of August to get a chance to meet them, to include Luis Marino Campo, right, who I just had dinner with three weeks ago, and he was chatting with me and my wife in, in, in The Hague, saying, David, I'm going to... Uh, 
President Bashir of Sudan. I know that you indicted President Charles Taylor of Liberia. Tell me what's going to happen. What kind of challenges am I going to have? I said, well, Luis, one is, is put that indictment on the table. Because let the politicians and the diplomats deal with it. You can never walk away from justice. Let them deal with justice as opposed to justice deal with politics. And that's what we did in Liberia when we unsealed the indictment against President Charles Taylor. And that's what he did just two weeks ago with Bashir. The beginning of the end of President Bashir started two weeks ago this past Monday. He can not travel. The political center is going to start softening and unraveling. The world is right now angry at uh, Luis Marino Ocampo. Everybody is saying uh, he's never going to be turned over. The indictment is a threat to peace. People are going to die. It's going to be, uh, you cannot go to a peace treaty because of it. That's exactly what took place in Liberia when I unsealed the indictment against Charles Taylor in June of 2003. Crane's crazy. He's threatening peace. Habu Mbeki of uh, South Africa called me a minor bureaucrat. And I said, well, in a press conference, I am not a minor bureaucrat. I'm a major bureaucrat. <laughs> uh, Charles, Liber uh, Charles Taylor of Liberia called me a redneck racist. Uh, and the rest of the world is silent. The United States, the United Nations, the very organization that created me gave me the mandate to prosecute those bear the greatest responsibility, they were silent on the issue of turning Charles Taylor over for a fair trial for the murder, rape, maiming, and mutilation. Of, he is individually criminally responsible for 1.2 million human beings. So it's all about politics. It took me two more years to get Charles Taylor handed over. Now he's in The Hague, being prosecuted for the special court for Sierra Leone, which was my tribunal, on all of those counts, 11 counts of war crimes, crimes against humanity. Horrific crimes. Crimes that, as I was giving the opening statement against the leadership of the Civil Defense Force, I told the tribunal, you're going to have to believe the unbelievable. There's no language in the world that can describe horror story that the people of West Africa went through. I'm going to do a little skit for you. I am a 25-year-old boy general from the Revolutionary United Front, and I come into a town called Penduma. And you are all been assembled in front of me, in the town center. And the rebels have surrounded your town. So, I need recruits. I need women and girls to be bushwives, to carry the ammunition, and I need young men to be child soldiers. All right? So, I go around, you, come over here. You, come over here. I'm wearing sunglasses. You ever seen the movie Blood Diamonds? It's exactly what they look like. Blood Diamonds is not a documentary, but that's exactly how they acted. Most of them are hopped up on cocaine. You, come here. Are you starting to get afraid? Here you are in Hamburg High School. Does the fear factor start? Are you afraid? You, don't look at me like that. Come up here. trembling, aren't you? It's scary, isn't it? Now, this is in the middle of Sierra Leone, just east of the diamond fields. Okay? And I need recruits. So, those are your parents right there. Okay? They have also been assembled. So, I'm going to give you an AK-47, you a machete, you a machete, and you an AK-47. Okay? 
kill them. You hesitate. I shoot her. She, she is dead now. <laughs> now, what are you going to do? Bang! You hesitated. You're dead. I take AK-47. I hand it to you. Kill them. Oh, you hesitated. Boom. You over the swing. Kill them. Are you starting to feel... I mean, I don't mean to single you out. It's just a, it's a dramatic. But do you understand? The, can, you, can you feel? You're getting tears in your eyes. Can you imagine the horror of just that moment? I'm describing you an exact situation that I described in my opening statement against the Revolutionary United Front. The parents back there are horrified. That was their technique. They would come in, surround the village, bring everybody together, separate the children, and have the children kill their parents and then move them off in the bush for sometimes up to five, six, seven years. And you were older. Most of the children were between the ages of seven, six and seven, to 10 or 12. Thank you. I hope I didn't scare you too much. Please have a seat. All right? Thank you. Can you imagine? Now, how do you describe that to a tribunal? How do you describe that to a war-weary world, a war crimes-weary world, to get them to be excited, to do something about that? That's the horror of Sierra Leone. Started by a group of individuals for their own personal criminal gain. The horror story lasted 10 years. It was beyond description. But yet, at the end of that 10 years, President Kaba, the president of Sierra Leone, reached out to the United Nations and said, I cannot deal with the horror story that has taken place. I need help. And the result of that was a new type of war crimes tribunal. At the time, the ICC, which we've been talking about, the International Criminal Court, had been around for the negotiations have been going on for about two or three years, but it didn't exist. Rwanda, uh, Rwanda was in existence, the tribunal in Rwanda, the tribunal in Yugoslavia was in existence. But they were very expensive. And the world really wasn't sure whether international criminal justice was worth the price of $135 million a year, each. So Kofi Annan went to the Security Council and said, we need to do a better job, more efficiently and effectively. And he created the world's first international, hybrid international war crime special court for Sierra Leone. And for the first time since Nuremberg, they were going to put it in the location where the crimes took place. So we weren't in the head. We were in Freetown, Sierra Leone, right in the middle of the crime scene. Was important. So that the United Nations was faced with this horror story, which I've described to you in a little skit, the horror story of all those people being murdered, raped, maimed, and mutilated. And then they had to come up with a way that we could do this in a way that was politically acceptable. Because I think if there's one thing you have to understand in this business, is it's all about politics. I can create something. I can make it happen. I can build the case. Luis Marino moved the indictment before the pretrial chamber to have it accepted. That's law stuff. That can be done. But the hand over Bashir someday, and they'll have to. They may not like it. Or the decision to hand over President Charles Taylor to my tribunal was a political decision. It's up to the politicians and the diplomats. So activism. Understanding, being involved, is what gets politicians noticed. And that's why you are here today. That's why you are starting your public education so that you can move forward in trying to move the political aspect of all of this forward. It's the bright red thread in all of this. So the UN Security Council, tired of an expensive two tribunals, decided Let's try to do this more effectively and efficiently, stumbling over my words here, 
And they gave me the mandate of prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility. In other words, just those who created, aided, abetted, and caused this horror story. Just like at Nuremberg, the top 23 individuals, or thereabouts, it ended up being 13 individuals who uh, I indicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity. All right. But they wanted to do it in a way that was efficient and effective, with a workable mandate, greatest responsibility. And then, not only did they wanted to do that, but they wanted to put it in the location where the crimes took place. And that's why the International Tribunal in West Africa, called the Special Court for Sierra Leone, is what I would say a minor success because it had a workable mandate. It was located right where the crimes took place. And that, I think, makes a huge difference in any tribunal. The big challenge for the ICTR in Rwanda was that it's not prosecuting in Rwanda. It's in Arusha, Tanzania, several hundred kilometers to the south. In The Hague, that's not the Balkans, is it, or Yugoslavia? So that's a challenge. And a big challenge for my good friend Luis Marino Campo in prosecuting these individuals at The Hague is, is they're not at the crime scenes because it's all about the victims. That's why we do this. This is what it's for. This You've seen victims. You've actually had people who survived, uh, I believe, Auschwitz and Dachau here talking to you, tears in their eyes. It's about the victims. So that's another thing I want you to take away uh, this morning. Politics is the bright red thread. For and about the victims. So when I arrived in Sierra Leone in August of 2002, the war had just ended. The smoke was still in the air. 90% of Sierra Leone, which is about the size of the state of South Carolina, was destroyed. 90%, I'm talking no roads, no running water, no electricity. Most of the buildings were burned out, and there were over 2.5 million human beings moving about with no place to live, no food, and no support. That's like the entire western portion of New York destroyed and everybody in it fleeing inside the state of New York with their villages and towns like Hamburg, New York, burning behind them. That's the horror story that I stepped into in August of 2000. Now, I'm not sure if these gentlemen uh, who survived the horror stories of Dachau and Auschwitz, but when I stepped off the airplane in August of 2002, the first thing that hit me was the smell of death. And if you're going to get into this business, you're going to be a part of this business, you're going to have to understand that it's all not glamour. It hit me just like that. The air was like a, a living and breathing entity, and it was like that for the entire three years that I was there. You looked up in the sky, it was hazy. And then through the haze, you saw thousands of vultures. Thousands of them feeding on what was out in the jungle, kinds of roads, which I won't get into this morning. But the point is, is that this is what you step into when you start creating a justice mechanism to seek justice for the victims with the reluctant politicians behind you giving you something to do and then not supporting you when you do it. Isn't that a crazy kind of a situation to find yourself in? Well, we started creating the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And within seven months, we had 13 indictments to include Charles Taylor, which I seal, he didn't know it yet. We arrested all of them in March of 2003. Remember, I got there in August of 2002. We arrested all of them in March of 2007. They were before the tribunal in April of 2000, or 2003, I'm sorry. 2002, March of 2003, before the tribunal in pretrial uh, situations in uh, April of 2003. And those cases are largely over, other than Charles Taylor, who sits in The Hague because the international community refused to hand him over until He's being prosecuted for what he was doing. So here we were in Freetown, Sierra Leone, building a court, investigating the crimes, drafting the indictments, and getting
getting ready to seek justice for the victims, which we did. I left there in June of 2005, largely done with the work that I was asked to do. Now, what were kind of the things that I want to highlight for you, and, and really the brief time that I have with you, and then also to allow questions and answers uh, from all of you. And that is, because it's foreign about the victims, I went out and started, for the first time, it had never been done before, the outreach program. Well, I walked the entire countryside in town hall meetings, listening to the people of Sierra Leone tell me what took place. Now, I wasn't there. Now, how do I get a group of, and they were usually two or three hundred people at these meetings. Sometimes it was less, sometimes it was more. But it averaged about 300 people for a meeting, sometimes under trees, sometimes in the town bari. Uh, but how do you get a group of Africans who have never, many of which have never seen a white man, particularly a blonde, tall North Carolinian? All right. Many of them had never seen a helicopter. Many of them thought it was a dragon. So, how do you get a group of people comfortable enough to tell you about what took place in their town, their district, what have you? You just walk in and say, hi, I'm uh, just like this morning. Hi, I'm David Crane. Uh, uh, I'm the pro chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. I'm here to tell you what I'm going to do today. Here's what I'm going to do for justice. And I'm going to have investigators coming, and they're going to be asking you questions about how you were raped, how you were mutilated, how, you, how your family was murdered. And uh, I'd like your appreciation. Are there any questions? <coughs> Thank you very much, and walk out. Now, you think, you, do you think you'd help me? You go, who the heck was that? Right? You just don't do things like that. So how do you, in fact, help the victims? And this is another key point. And that's the cultural approach to international justice. And this is another important thing for you to remember. The question I would ask you is the justice we seek as the international community, the justice they want. Mm -hmm. That's the $25 question, isn't it? Is the justice we seek the justice they want? We may be wrong. So you have to take in the cultural aspects of what has taken place within a particular part of the world, and in my case, West Africa, but it can be anywhere. Well, I was lucky because I happened to have a master's degree in West African studies. I spoke a West African language. I had taken courses in poetry, music, dance, uh, culture, as well as history, political science, geography of the area. So I appreciated and understood fully that the cornerstone to West African society, because you notice I don't say Sierra Leone, I say West African, because it's important for you to understand. Countries were carved up by cynical monarchs in Europe calling them Sierra Leone and Guinea and Nigeria. But when you go to West Africa, they don't consider themselves Sierra Leonean or Nigerian or what have you. They consider themselves culturally one and the same, the Fula, the Igbo, the Hausa, what have you. So when you ask a Sierra Leonean or someone who lives in Sierra Leone who they are, they, they finally tell you they're from Sierra Leone about the fourth or fifth statement. So you have to understand and appreciate how all of this is important. Okay. So, how do I get a group of Sierra Leoneans, just like this, in a town hall meeting, just like this? How do you get them to stand up and tell you what happened here? In Bo, Kabbalah, Pujuhun, Fort Loco, Kailahun, wherever it may be. Well, first thing you do is you take, you have your team of outreach personnel, all Sierra Leoneans, go up about a week ahead of time and ask permission can the chief prosecutor come and talk to the people in this region? Talk to the paramount chief. Talk to the district officer. If the permission was gathered, uh, granted, and it usually was, okay, then we'd have an advance team come in two, two days ahead of time to start talking to the people about what's about to take place, talk a little bit about the special court for Sierra Leone, uh, and start having them think about what's going to happen. Pick this meeting site. It would always be a 
high table, as they call it, where the paramount chief would be there, the mullah, the local priest, and other dignitaries. And of course, I was always in the center, on this high table, very much removed from the people who were out to our front. There would be speeches, and they would be greeting. But the first thing they would do, and this is so impressive to me, is they would have prayers. Everybody would rise. Everybody would say the Muslim common prayer. You know that Sierra Leone is 70% Muslim? Then they'd all say the Lord's Prayer together. And then we would have our meeting. They are one of the most religiously tolerant people in the world. They all know each other's religion. I think that was wonderful. Then there'd be greeting speeches and stuff. All the things that you see politicians, etc. In any meeting that you had been in or uh, watched in Hamburg, New York, or wherever it may be. And then they would hand the microphone over to me. And everybody's looking at me, this white man who they've never seen. So you know what I did? Put the microphone down, just like when Drew handed me the microphone. I don't want the microphone. I don't want to stand over here. I want to talk to you. I want to look in your faces. I want you to look at me. Get close to me. And I walked, and I would plunge right into the middle of the group. Now, my close protection officers were shot at first, because their job was to make sure that someone didn't take a shot at me. I had a level 3A vest on me, which is uh, enough to stop a 45 caliber or 9 millimeter round at close range that the FBI gave me before I left. It about, weighs about 3.5 pounds. You wouldn't even know if I was wearing it right now. It doesn't breathe, though. So when you're standing in front of a group of West Africans, 100 degrees, 90 percent humidity, needless to say, I lost a lot of a uh, lot of weight doing this. But I plunged right on in. And there was a gasp at first until word got out that that's what my modus was. And here I'm standing in the middle of all these people, and it was almost like people would part from me. They were all, they were frightened of me still. Now how do I get now? The reason I'm spending time because I think this is really so important. This is what it's all about. Whether you're studying genocide or whether you're studying whatever subject in this area, this is still what it's about. It's about the people. All right, because it's for and about them. And they don't like the law because the law has always been used against them, not for them. The law has been a tool for the other people to commit the crimes. You found in your studies that the law actually authorizes domestically people to commit war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. All right? In the Holocaust, in the 1930s, what Hitler was doing was legal under German law. Okay? So watch out for the law. The law can be used as a tool for good, but the law can be used as a tool for bad. So here you are trying to get people to understand that the law is here for them. But what I would do, instead of doing what I just did dramatically there, I'm David Cray and I'm the chief prosecutor standing up here like this, rocking back on my heels, and I'm here to help you, is I would humble myself before them. I would say, I'm David Crane. I'm from the state of North Carolina. My family is not here. And I would talk about my family. Why and Judy? Two kids who live in North Carolina, who are high school teachers, I might add. And I talk about my pets, Annie, our dog, Uncle Skeeter, our cat, and Justice, our cat. And they would start laughing. They'd be tittering. What? What's going on here? What is this? What is this man about? This big, powerful man who came in this helicopter, and there's UN peacekeeping troops all around, lots of guns. What is going on here? I talked to him about my pets. I said, I am away from my family. I have come here to Sierra Leone to see what I can do to maybe help you. And I've left my family back in the United States along with everybody else in my team. And I was just wondering if you would give me the honor and the privilege being a part of your family today. And I would just pause. There would be a pause. 
was there were people would literally come up and hug me. And you could just feel the tension drift out of the room. See how this is happening now? All of a sudden, even now, I mean, if I started asking you questions about yourself personally, don't you feel a little bit more comfortable telling me that? Yes, absolutely. And then I would say, thank you. I'm humbled to be a part of your family today. And hopefully you'll allow me to be a part of your family while I'm here over the years trying to help you seek justice. And now that you've made me part of your family, let's talk. For three to four hours, three to four hours, I would stand in front of these people, and it was all over Sierra Leone, and I would listen to one horror story after another. We would laugh together, cry together, we would hug. I mean, just think how dramatic it is. Someone would come up and say, I am so and so. My wife was raped and killed in front of me, and my children had to count the times that she was raped. And that man over there did it. Wow. That's the kind of drama that you, we would have. Oh, and it was humorous, too. Uh, people would want to know, because we'd always have, it was always a question and answer. I wasn't preaching to them, I was listening. And then I would say, uh, what questions do you have? You can always ask me questions. So someone would, would say, uh, why do you have three cats? You know, so you just laughed. Well, that would ease the tension. So I'd talk about Uncle Skeeter and Liberty. I forgot the other one, Justice. Not Liberty and Justice. We now have another one. Because unfortunately, Uncle Skeeter passed away. So we now have Uncle Sam. And she's a cute little gray girl. The point is, is that now they're identifying me not as a huge white man from the United Nations, but as a guy who is just a family man who owns three cats. See how all of a sudden now I'm a little less imposing? And that's how you do it. That's how you get people to respond. And that's how they did. Did you know? Did you know that I had to prove my case not by documents like they did at Nuremberg, where they had train loads of documents? very few witnesses. It was completely the other way around in West Africa. There was nothing written down, very little written down. It was done by witnesses. I had 395 witnesses. 394 showed up. The 395th died of an aneurysm on his way down. Just an act of God. These brave men and women would come in to the court that they built. I mean, we literally built it out of lava rock in August, starting in August of 2002. And in one year, we had a state-of-the-art courtroom right outside my door. And I would watch these people walking, because this was their court. That's why it's so important to have the court in the location where it is. They built the court, they could walk into their court, and they could see justice done. And that's exactly what we did. We would walk up to their court. Obviously, we had to do some screening to make sure nobody was bringing in weapons and those kinds of things. We had a plate glass separating the courtroom from the visitor's gallery, okay, and it was, you know, bulletproof glass. But you would see them come in every day, and I would look out my window and watch them walking up the hill to their court. You would go into the courtroom we would have witnesses come in. Some of them would be let in because they're missing their eyes, because they were scooped out by somebody from the Revolutionary United Front. Some of them would be carried in because they don't have any limbs, because they were chopped off by the rebels. And they would sit in the chair to give their testimony. And I can remember one time, this person was describing a horror story that took place in a particular part of Sierra Leone. She looked at this individual, these individuals who we hadn't died, the big, big men, as we call them, the kakatua, which is Creole for big fish. You did this to me. I do it this way because I have a hand. She did. She was pointing her stub at these individuals, saying, you did this to me. Is 
that justice? To watch this person then after she gives her testimony and is cross-examined, etc. When her testimony is done, she gets up and walks out of the courtroom past three individuals who did this to her or caused it to happen with her head held high dignity in her stride, in her own small way, in her own small way, she has achieved a sense of reconciliation and peace and justice for the family that she no longer has. I am still humbled by the people of West Africa who lost everything. How can you live? You've just been a bushwife for five or six years. You have two or three children because you've been raped. You have no mom, no dad, your brothers and sisters have been destroyed, and yet now you have the rest of your life in your own life. How old are you? You're 16. Okay, you'd be about that age. How do you get up every morning? Well, the little things that international justice can do is to at least give people a sense that something was done. That you had a chance to tell your story officially on the record so that your family didn't disappear into the sands of time and nothing was done. Okay? Before we do a little bit of question and answers and we finish up, I do want to also say that telling one's story is so important. Now, an international criminal court can only tell a part of the story, it is a criminal case. And so we only represent, representationally charged. A murder here, a group of raping here, just to capture the gravamen of what took place in Sierra Leone. You can't charge every rape, every death, every sexual slavery, every pillage, every plundering, every enslavement, what have you, okay? So you have to representationally charge. So not everybody's tragedy, personal tragedy, because there's 1.2 million of them is going to be able to tell their story. So how do you get your story on the record? We have a thing called a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which we had. In other words, allowing people to publicly tell their story, or privately, about what took place in whatever town they were from. And it would go officially on the record. Because in my mind, the ultimate atrocity is allowing a group of human beings like the Armenians in the Near East Asian Holocaust in the turn of the last century, to disappear into the sands of time and nothing is done. Isn't that the ultimate atrocity? So that's why you are starting your thinking and your studies. That's why I do what I do, is to prevent the ultimate atrocity, and that is allowing, for example, the people of Darfur horror story that they've gone through to disappear into the sands of time, and nothing was done. So I'll leave you with this, and then we'll do a little Q&A, and there's a little plug for Impunity Watch I see behind you. I love these people. They're good. They're just, just sniffing. Uh, I didn't even ask, and it's up. Truth plus justice equals sustainable peace. Truth, usually through a truth commission. Justice, through a some type of justice mechanism, it can be a domestic court, but it'll, it could be an international tribunal, equals sustainable peace. If you have one of those missing, then you probably have a peace that is illusory. It's a peace that seems to be there, but will unravel over time. Last plug, because I told you about indifference, when I came back from West Africa in the summer of 2005, and uh, went up to Syracuse University where I teach law, I said, I'm going to start an ability to one, monitor impunity, but also let the world know what's going on real time, anywhere, any place, about what's, going, what's happening. And we use the example of Hong Frank. Well, and I was just teaching at Utrecht University, and right out my door was a little statue of Hong Frank in the Netherlands. She's a little girl, about that high, a sculptor, and she's standing like this, This is exactly her stance. It's like this, chin up. Defiance in front of tyranny. And 
every day I'd go by, there would always be some flowers at her feet. This has been going on for decades. Imagine what Anne Frank would have been able to do instead of writing a diary and hiding it somewhere in the hope that someday after her death, someone may read it, that she had a real-time blog, turned the computer on saying, they're killing us all, help. Well, that's what some community watch is designed to do, is to not only every day report what's going on, but also provide a message center for someone to blog on saying, they're killing us in some part of the world, help. So with that, I have a few minutes of question and answers, uh, or questions, and I'll, I'll give the answers. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free. Even from the, quote, moms and dads in the background. So, any questions? Yes, ma'am. What did you go to school for? What did I go to school for? As far as what? Uh, I went to a lot of schools, so yeah, it just. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I'm, I think your, your implied question is, is, how did you get to be where you are, or what you've done? Did you study for that? The answer is, no, I didn't. Uh, when I walked through the portals of uh, E.I. Whitehall at Syracuse University's School of Law, I had no idea any more than Robert Jackson had any idea when he was going to high school just south of here. He didn't have an, and practicing law just south of here. Uh, he had, I had no idea that if I would someday be a chief prosecutor of an international tribunal. It's just the way it happened. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, thank you, that doesn't mean that you know, it's, it's just all a matter of luck. That's not true. Starting doing this is important. Going to college, studying whatever you like. If you want to get into the justice part of this, then going to law school and becoming a very good criminal lawyer. Now, people are always shocked when I say this. Because if you're going to go into courtroom, you've got to know how to prove a case. You know, it's not magic. It's just good criminal law work and trial advocacy. So if people say, well, how come I, I've taken all the international humanitarian law stuff that I could ever take and human rights courses and stuff? I said, well, that's not who I was hiring. I was hiring criminal lawyers who could know, know how to go into a courtroom and put, as we, our, the motto of my office was put bad guys in jail. And that's what we did. We put bad guys in jail. And so, Go to school. Now, there is a wonderful, and this is that's just the law part, but there's also non-governmental organization work and governmental work as well. So that you can work for the federal government doing this business, in the State Department, in the Department of Defense, or you can do this uh, as, an, uh, as, a, as an activist in a non-governmental organization. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, they're always looking for people who are aware, conscious, and ready to work hard. So that if you're going to college, you're in high school, you're joining organizations such as this, you're taking part in seminars such as this, you're doing the same thing in college, you're volunteering in the summer, you're getting out there, all right, you're doing scut work, you're paying your dues, then you can become a professional, a hired person in these areas. Okay? You will never get rich in this business. But that's just cash. That's just money. The richness, the richness of the business is this last story that I will tell you. When I was leaving Sierra Leone, uh, it was my, it was two days before I left. I was sitting in my office, literally putting things away. The packers were coming to take all my papers and all of that stuff. Um, there's a lot of papers of which someday the Robert H. Jackson Center will have. There's like 12 linear yards of the stuff. Uh, my research assistant, Syracuse, is going through it right now, cataloging it. She's very mad at me because it's boring stuff. But a group of members of the of the outreach office, which had been with me for so long, said, "We would like, could you come down to the uh, to the meeting area in, in our cafeteria?" So I went down there, and there was 
all the Sierra Leoneans on the court and others to include members of the civil society. And there was a uh, group of individuals with music. And they went through a ceremony where they made me a paramount chief, which is a huge honor, and which I consider the, the highest of honor. They don't do this for everybody. And they made me an honorary paramount chief. They gave me the robes. They went through the ceremony. Nothing hurt. They didn't do anything that hurt. It was wonderful. And then when I was going back to my office, which was up on a hill by itself in a, in a separate compound, uh, I kept my robes on out of respect. And the, and the musicians followed me, and I danced all the way back up the hill to my office. And as I was walking up the, up the hill, other Sierra Leoneans and the Nigerian UN guards who were manning the watchtowers and the machine guns and the tanks we're all standing, clapping, doing this stuff. And I thought, you know, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. I can give you a thousand stories about this is what it's all about. But I thought I would just give you one that's, uh, that was, I think, a real, real positive. And uh, with that, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, tell us about your influence as a teenager. What do you recommend to us? Well, I think that's a great question. And that is, is that the teenagers make a difference? And the answer is, of course. Right now, you are part of this. You're going to go out now in your grades, and you're going to be talking to your friends. You're going to maybe be forming clubs or at least discussion groups. You're going to be talking about it, right? In this business, small steps matter. Okay? Just 10 years ago, the indictment of Charles Taylor, the indictment of uh, Omar Bashir, Karadich being roped and brought to justice was unthinkable. Just through small steps of a lot of people, we have been advancing the jurisprudence and the concept of justice. So small steps at any level make a difference, okay? Don't think that what you're doing isn't making a difference. It's a pebble in the water. You're the pebble, and you're not seeing much. But the ripples go far beyond what you've started. So be involved, talk to your friends, do what you can at your age, your location, and your level, and I'll guarantee you that that ripple effect will be far greater than you think. That's a good question. Do you have a question? Yeah. Tell us about Jackson must play a role. Robert Jackson was a great influence. I can remember I had uh, there's a great book uh, by Telford Taylor called uh, uh, is, it, is it Judgment Nur a Nuremberg? Yeah. Anatomy of a Trial. Anatomy of a Trial. Yes. Obviously, to make that great impression, I can't even remember the name of it. But I remember reading the chapter on his opening statement the day before I gave my opening statement. And that was a huge uh, presence in my, uh, in my, uh, in my life. When I, it, it's an amazing thing. You're sitting there in the courtroom for the first time. This is a brand new courtroom. This is the first thing that's going to happen. Judges give it their opening remarks, and then the presiding judge pulls down his glasses. <coughs> you will now have the opening statement of the chief prosecutor. And he looks at you and goes, Mr. Prosecutor, you stand up and you bow. You notice the nice robes. Of course, Justice Jackson didn't have those then, but in the international level, I have a black robe, which we call a charbot, a white, basically a, a napkin. You walk up to the podium. You open your opening statement and look up. The ghosts of 100,000 people were standing next to me at that moment. It's a humbling privilege to be standing there. And the courtroom was packed with Sierra Leoneans and others. And as I gave my opening statement, of course, I can't hear them because it's a bulletproof glass. They can hear me because there's microphones and television too so that you can actually because my back is to them so they can actually see me people were weeping gasping shaking their heads hugging I mean there was an emotional event back there that I never saw that's the power of the law that is the power of people realizing it no one is above the law the law is fair and that the rule of the law is more powerful so I think I've given my uh, my hour. Thank you.
I'm Charlene and I'm Alex. Um, this is on behalf of our appreciation for you coming here today. Um, it was a great experience and we appreciated everything that you had to say. So thank you. one of those two when you're in the business. But thank you ladies so much. And thank you all. And thank you for making a difference. You will make a difference. And someday I'll look and I'll go, you know, I think I know that person. I may not, I may not have remembered your name, but I may just remember your face. And that person is up there speaking to camera saying that they're going to indict somebody. Now hopefully someday we're going to put ourselves out of this business. Uh, but I fear not. So stay involved. Do what you can. Remember the baby steps, okay? You will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you.